I watched that movie Tortured for Christ last night. Oh, Man, great. You, you had to put in the last five minutes, John, because you choked me up. I mean, big time. <laughs> oh, those, those last five minutes, yeah. Yeah, that was big. I realized I want to make sure that I have that faith. If I yeah, ever came exactly. across that. And it, and it was almost like I was sobbing because I don't know if I'm there or not. You know, I guess you get those doubts. Absolutely. Yeah, we all have those. And, and uh, there's no easy answer for that. You know, I mean, people can do horrible things and they do. And and, and our faith would be in that if, if the day comes, give me the faith and the courage and give me the words. And, you know, you'll have to be with me because it's it's beyond our flesh. You're listening to a conversation that I had with John Groders, the director of the movie Torture for Christ. And to be perfectly honest with you, that film was somewhat of a gut check for me because it really caused me to reflect on whether or not I would have enough guts and courage to stand up for my own faith in the same way that the main character in this movie did. You know what I'm talking about. Not just being ridiculed or made fun of or even being ousted by your friends or coworkers, but having to make a choice to stand true to your faith in Jesus Christ in spite of being persecuted in a way that could potentially cost you your own life. So my hope for you on today's show is that you leave encouraged and equipped to do what's right and to stand firm in your faith regardless of whatever pain or persecution it may cost you. Because no matter the price, you can be confident in knowing that the Lord is right there with you, giving you the strength to pull you through every step of the way. Before we meet today's guest, I want to encourage you to join the Men Unplugged community. All you do is go to menunplugged.net to sign up to our weekly email list. While there, you can like or follow our Facebook or Twitter page as well. All right, you ready to go? Let's do this. Welcome to the Men Unplugged show. Get ready to plug in and recharge your life, family, and career while igniting your faith in Christ. Now, here's your host and champion of helping men live with passion and purpose. Jeff Jarena. Hey, how's it going? Jeff Jarena here, and welcome to episode 76 of the Mental Plug Show. Without any further ado, we're just going to jump right in to the interview today. So let's meet today's featured guest, John Groders. John, welcome to the show, brother. Thank you, Jeff. Glad to be here. Are you ready to plug in and recharge? I think I am ready to plug in and recharge. Let's do it. All right, man, let's get it going. As a writer, director, and producer, John has won numerous awards for his faith-based films and videos across the globe. As the owner of Groder's Productions of Ferocious Films, some of his more recent work includes Torture for Christ, The Noah Interview, The Frontier Boys, American Sailors, and several upcoming films that share the story of real American heroes while staying true to America's Judeo-Christian roots. So I got to ask you, John, with all you got going on, Seriously, man, are you getting any sleep lately? You know, it's kind of funny, Jeff. Um, Workload-wise, I'm sort of used to a, a certain rhythm, but the reason I'm not getting sleep is my son and daughter-in-law have uh, flown out of Michigan out to California, and they went out there. My son has graduated seminary, and he's uh, applying at some churches out there. They've got two kids who are aged four and two, Ooh. and they ask us, to, uh, my wife and I, you know, just to, to keep, keep the kids for a few days. And uh, then they got snowed out of returning. So this is this is a week and counting now. So it's been a while since I've had a four-year-old and a two-year-old at, uh, that we were responsible for. And uh, that can chew up sleep more than writing movies, directing movies, running companies. <laughs> but it's a lot of fun at the same time. Well, congratulations on that um, on the graduation there. I can tell you as a uh, seminary grad, man, when you get out of there, the first thing you do is like you're like, thank you, Lord, for getting me through that. I can't oh, believe yeah. I did that. It's good to be done. Yes, Lou. Well, congratulations on that and being a grandfather. So yeah, I, I can tell you having young kids myself, yeah, you're probably not getting much sleep during that time. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, they take some work, but uh, it's a great thing to be. I'll tell you that. I never thought I'd get here. So I want to ask you this because you're a writer, a producer, a director. I'm just thinking here, how did you get your start in doing all these things? I think each of us has a distinct personality and a drive and creating and writing. If I were to really think about it, I mean, I'm sure I've been doing that since I could breathe. Um, That's just how I'm, how I'm made. And, and if there's a blank piece of paper, I'll fill it. If there's a song that needs to be written, I'll write it. So writing songs or writing, uh, 
creating is just how I am. It's just the way, and, and I've been in the Christian music industry for years, and I've said, you know, moving from uh, musician and songwriter to movie maker, it's the same exact thing. It's learning the tools, it's getting a little bit of training, and then it's taking a risk to try and create something that didn't exist before and bringing the best team you can possibly find along with you and and when everybody puts their ingredients into the mix you know you can create things and you can make things um and it's it's just the way i'm driven and it's just the way uh i I just have to exist i think so i'm sort of finally realizing that well i'll tell you what i i've uh seen some of your stuff you do some really cool stuff and the way that you just tell the stories and you bring um the viewer in to the story, and we're going to get into some of the stuff that you've done here, and one of those specifically is Tortured for Christ. And and I got to talk about this real quick because <laughs> I'm laughing here just thinking about this. You did, you know, the Noah interview, which is now for the the Ark Encounter and Answers in right, Genesis. Right, so right. <laughs> I, I just have to say this right here. That thing cracked me up. I mean, it was hilarious. <laughs> so, so talk about that a little bit, and and maybe how is that different than maybe doing a docudrama? I mean, what what are you oh, doing differently goodness. for that? Well, let me give you the backstory on that, Jeff. So, so our I, we have a company here in Holland, Michigan. It's called Groters Productions, and we're about a staff of about twelve to fifteen people. And one of the best things that ever happened to us way back in two thousand seven, we got a phone call from these guys that I'd never met before, and they were building a museum. Museum uh, down near Cincinnati, Ohio, on the northern border of Kentucky, and it was called the Creation Museum. And they were looking for a, a production company who could come alongside them and produce upwards of 50 different films that were going to be all through that museum. Some were wow. little kiosk videos, some were multi screen special effects theaters, the gamut. And uh, through a long process of application, and we ended up getting that job. And it started, it really launched me on a creative enterprise, but also uh, from a personal standpoint, I, it's, a, it's a subject matter where I had not studied anything of any value in my life. So I have said to people before, well, I've been a Christian since I was a kid. I kind of became a biblical Christian after I met Ken Ham because he really and his organization, Answers in Genesis, um, introduced me from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation to uh, an approach to the scriptures, which I found amazing. And in that process at the Creation Museum, I did a number of highly scientific kiosk videos, and I was interviewing some of the top PhD scientists from all around the world, the top experts in CAGE, in astronomy, in uh, astrophysics, in catastrophic plate tectonics and biology guys way smarter than i was but i was pulling out of them these things which i had never learned before which have to do with creation science in that process they wanted a main theatrical first thing people would see when they came to the museum and uh i took a big risk and i decided rather than just sort of do a scientific sounding (laughs) i wanted to do something that the kids would really have fun with so i wrote a script called men in white and uh, I remember the day I was pitching it to Ken. He's Australian. You never quite know. He's got a very dry sense of humor. And the rest of his team, Mike Zovath and Patrick Marsh, I said, all right, guys, now I want you to bear with me, but I'm going to try this on you. And I've got this story called Men in White where these two angels named Gabe and Mike fly in in white overalls, and they're trying to get the attention of this young girl who's sitting outside one night asking the big questions of whether there was a creator or not. And they fly into her world, and they show her bang, 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 all kinds of stuff, every evidence they can think of. They put on a massive show, slideshow, light show, everything. And at the end of this great presentation that these angels kind of give, with their, and they're funny, they're humorous, they fly around, they step on each other. At the end of the show, she didn't see a thing they said, and she decides, nah, she doesn't want anyone to think she's stupid, so she's not going to believe in a creator God. And then the angels will say to the audience, well, we didn't get through to her, but but maybe you can learn something, so go through this museum and learn all you can. That's the nature of Men in White. Okay. So it was a sillier approach, right, to create, and, and it was a fun, fun film, and it ran for 10 years in their uh, 40s theater where, you know, water squirt you in the face and your chairs shake and the sound and three screens. And Men in White was a was a lot of fun, and it sort of it really started off people's experience at the Creation Museum. You got 
informed. You learned things, but in the process, you didn't feel like you were watching PBS. You know what I mean? It was, right. it was fun. So we developed a good relationship with uh, Answers in Genesis back at that time. So fast forward 10 years. We hadn't, didn't do anything for them really for 10 years. And now these guys have this amazing vision to build a full-scale Noah's Ark uh, and uh, make it into a theme park um, in Kentucky. And uh, so they, they called again and they said, hey, we have two different media pieces that we'd like you to tackle. And uh, the first one was actually supposed to be uh, a film that would show all people were waiting in line to get into the arc okay. because they thought there could be long waits and people would have to wait underneath. So they were going to have seven monitors and they said, why don't you do uh, something about, you know, just give people some background information on the arc where they can learn, you know, different things of how it was made. So the same instinct of men and white, I'm like, they just spent money to come to a theme park. They're waiting in line. Why don't we try to do something fun and entertaining? But I was thinking at the time, it's also got to be a film that you might only see for two or three minutes. You might pick it up in the middle or you might just see the beginning. You know, you don't necessarily get a chance to see the entire film if you're in a queue line. So I try to write, write a film with a little bit of a different structure than I normally would. And we came up with a fun idea that um, what if Noah back in the day was being interviewed by like the local newspaper? The pits. And what if, <laughs> yeah, the pits, <laughs> right. The, the Pangea international tribune from Pangea. Um, so, and what if, as somewhat is true today, he wasn't getting a f very fair shake. So that this crew came with a bunch of attitude, which would make sense because the world was filled with violence and sin, and the Lord was about to destroy them. So we needed to send a uh, a crew that was essentially pure evil. Um, although we also wanted to have a little bit of fun with it. So we came up with this character, Ada, and she was kind of this witchy uh, journalist. And we came up with uh, a sketch artist that was sort of her cameraman doing a sketch, and then a scribe who was you know, recording the words. So it's kind of like the ancient film crew, obviously long before they had film crews. Right. And, uh, you know, I think that they... Uh, the, the, the tone of the film could be summarized. There's a scene where so Edda sits down and she's facing Noah, and behind him, in the distance, there is the almost finished ark sitting on the top of a hill. Right. So, Noah, what is this monstrosity behind you? Right. He looks behind him and he says, uh, It's a ship. A ship, she says. Well, it's not like any ship I've ever seen. Where are the oars and where are the sails? He's like, Well, all right. Call it an ark then. <laughs> well, what's an ark? It's a ship with no oars or no sails. You know, so we have this sort of, you know, Jewish man and this aggressive journalist, and he doesn't want to be there. He's busy, and she doesn't want to be there because she thinks it's ridiculous. But through that setup, through that style, we actually get her to – uh, probe, and he ends up showing her models and showing her diagrams, and he explains how the joints worked and what he uses for pitch and why the size, God gave him the size. In fact, at one point, she says, you know, well, how do you know what size to build? God told me. God told you, just right. like that. He goes, yeah, I wrote it down. <laughs> and he right. pulls a little scroll out of his pocket. <laughs> yeah, he says, make it 300 cubits long and 50 cubits wide and 30 cubits. So, like, even Noah might have had to take notes, you know? So it's done a little bit lighthearted. Um, at one point, his son breaks in with a giant uh, dinosaur head and says, you know, Where are we, what are we going to do with these? Dad, they're huge. They won't fit. And he says, hey, we'll take young ones, you know, babies. Oh, that's a good idea. So the whole thing about the Noah interview was truthfully to try to educate people, you know, but to sneak in the information like we snuck it in with Men in White years earlier. Now, here's what happened. They got the film and they put it in the queue line. And I'm sort of tickled by this. People were not moving. The line was backing up. Because they were and watching it. They were wanting they're, yeah. to watch the whole film. So it didn't really uh, succeed in what it was intending to do, which was to be a Q-line film. And instead, they put a theater on the second of three decks. And now all day, every day, people stop and sit down and, uh, and watch the Noah interview on deck two at the Ark. Um, so that's the story behind that film. The quote there that you'd said, that exchange between the reporter and Noah, I actually wrote that down because I thought that was just hilarious. And then at the end, when the tabloid, when they leave, uh, Noah's wife says, well, how did you think the interview went? And he said, oh, it's better than expected. And then she says, you know, scoffers are going to scoff. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's a whole thing. Yeah. Is just, it's just hilarious. It really is. So I, I want to ask you this, though. 
now that you've been doing all this for a while, the writing, the directing, producing, which one would you say here? Give me about a 20, 30 second answer that you like the best. Oh, goodness gracious. Well, producing would become third. I'll, I'll, that one's last. I let my wife try to do most of the contracts and budget negotiations and that kind of thing. Producing is all business. So for me, it's writing and directing. And I would say directing. I I love working uh, with a crew and with actors and on set. I mean, I, it, it taxes everything that I've got, uh, takes all my attention and all my focus. Hopefully, I can be an encouraging presence and also a very efficient presence because we, we're spending a lot of money. And so you've got to be so efficient and we we really do our best to be extraordinarily well planned out so that every every minute of the day uh, moves like clockwork so i would say man it's a great privilege to be able to direct uh and have you know a team at your disposal that works that that kind of a project talking about directing john your new docudrama tortured for christ by the way i just watched it last night i know we spoke about this um before we started recording but man that movie was compelling. And and at numerous times, man, I just was breaking down. I was crying yeah. like a baby. And you know, I was like, why am I crying here? And I and I was like, I realized I was crying, calling out to the Lord saying, Man, I want to be a Christian like that. I want to be a follower of Christ that's gonna stand firm. And men unplugged, that's what we're gonna talk about today. That is the topic is how can we stand firm in the midst of all these things that are coming against you. And the the movie here is about Richard and Sabina Wormbrandt, who stood firm in the faith. They continued to keep God's mandate of sharing the gospel. They never denied our Lord. And in the midst of all this, of all what being thrown into a prison, labor camps, and being savagely tortured by the Russian Communist Party, they continued to stand firm. So what did you get from that movie? How did it impact you? Well, you know, Jeff, the key of this movie is this is a true story. So this is a a chance to actually meet real people who lived through real circumstances just a generation before you and I. And, you know, the Warm Brands were a couple living in uh, the country of Romania. He was a Lutheran pastor. And when the the communists at the end of World War II, uh, as part of the spoils of victory with the Allies, they were basically just awarded the country of Romania. And so a million uh, uh, communist troops poured across the border in 1948. Communism um, is a brutally atheistic uh, form of government. And under Stalin, you know, you, we have no idea the persecution and the re-education, and it's it's a it's a thing we see happening again today in North mm-hmm. Korea and, and ever more so in China and other places. Uh, it's a it's a re- it's a recurring issue, I believe, of this of Satan that Christians will be uh, oppressed and persecuted and hated. Jesus said they hated me; mm-hmm. they're going to hate you also, and it it makes no sense. You can be the nicest person, you can be giving, community oriented, but the forces of darkness will hate you. And and so Richard, like many many Christians in that day was arrested on the streets, was thrown into uh, these prisons, and to be in a Russian prison was to be tortured. Right. And brutal, physical, I'm not talking like some sort of mild psychological torture. I, if you read these books, it's beyond description, the horrible things they did to these these men. Yeah. And uh, and his story is he, he's, he's in there for uh, eight years, he gets out, but he goes right back to preaching and he's thrown back in again. And he doesn't he doesn't back, like you said, he doesn't back down. He ends up in prison for over 14 years in isolation for three. But um, there's something about Richard Wormbrand. That, well, the main thing is he survived. He should never have survived. Right. He should have died many times. He was sent to the place in a, in a prison called Targu Akna, where they send you to a place called Room 4 when you were within two weeks of death. He had such bad tuberculosis. His body had been beaten so badly, he was on death. He was in hospice. Uh, no one ever lasted more than two weeks in Room 4. Richard lived there for two years and ushered many other men into the next world at their bedside, praying with them and loving them. And so he survives. And so, uh, and then another miracle, he's ransomed out of the country by a Norwegian mission, and he comes to the United States in 1965. And uh, he spends three days, and he takes a piece of paper, and he writes a story. He just he just kind of writes a stream of consciousness story called Tortured for Christ, and it becomes an international bestseller. Nobody had really survived 
a Nazi prison camp. Nobody yeah. had written about what it was like behind the Iron Curtain before Tortured for Christ was published in 1967. Now, I don't remember that, of course, but people read it. It got the attention of an American uh, congressman. Richard was asked to testify before a U.S. Senate subcommittee, and he was telling them what goes on behind the Russians. And one of them said, well, you know, you say this, can you prove it or something? And he says, what? He took his shirt off right in front of them. And they looked at his torso with 18 puncture wounds in it Man. from his time in prison. You can't fake that. So he became the – out of this, you know, he was no longer going to be able to do um, what he really wanted. He had a deep love, which is crazy, for the Russians and for the Germans. Right. And first they were persecuted by the Nazis, which is actually the next movie I'm trying to do, which is the prequel to Tortured for Christ. And then after the Nazis left, then they're persecuted by the Russians. But the strange thing is Richard had prayed for years that the Lord would open a door for him to reach Russians with the love of Christ. And here what happened, the Lord just brought him right into his house wow. and then put him right in the prison with them. And so what's the real miracle to me isn't only that he survived, but that he was able to maintain a love for his captors who just un did unspeakably cruel things to him for years and years and years. And uh, so how does it change you? You, know, you said you were affected watching this film. Wow, it changes time. all of us because he represents what happened to all of the apostles, hmm. all of the early church believers. How many martyrs, how many were sent to the Colosseum to be devoured by the wild animals? How many were the, sent to face the gladiators? You know, 11 of the 12 disciples are crucified. Some were flayed. Some were dragged to the streets of Alexandria. I mean, it is not a surprise, biblically, for followers of Jesus to be to be persecuted. And in the back of our minds, we who have been Christians in the West, who have lived without a hint of that kind of persecution, right. um, wonder. We want to be we we want to be just as much part of the kingdom as those first century Christians, as those amazing stories that have happened under the torture. What would happen if our day were to come? You know, would we stand? Um, would we crumble? You know, if we crumbled, would the Lord forgive us? Because right. <laughs> everyone has a break point. Nobody, including the worm brands, would would tell you. But what what I what changed me is I start to say the problem here isn't my isn't that I can't think about how strong I need to be, but what what I have never prayed for is to love my enemies in the first place. Right. I've right. never even tried that. So Richard sees the Soviets taking over this country, and he prays that God increases his love for them. Wow. Think about that. You know, yeah. that's a huge challenge. Um, well, I mean— And one that we can grow in, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I can just tell you, there's just so many things that— you can get from this movie. I, I'm just within the first five to 10 minutes, the movie starts and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it starts where the Romanian church leaders from all different denominations are there to back up the communist party at this Congress session. And Richard and his wife, Sabina are there and they're like, man, I'm not liking this. This is not good. Yeah. And, and his wife turns to him and said, you know, you have to say something about it. And he said, but if I do that, you're not going to have a husband, meaning that they're going to take me. And she said, well, I didn't marry a coward. I was like, whoa, there's a hard pill to swallow right there, isn't it? Because as a man, you're faced with, okay, what do I do here? My wife is well, saying she's married a brave man. And I know if I say something, this is not going to turn out good. And so he goes up there. And this big radio broadcast announcement just continues to man stand firm in the faith, saying, this is wrong what we're doing here. We have to stand for what Christ stood for. And then, you know what? Everything from there, that's how the movie plays out. Well, this is a true, uh, like I said, it's a true story. So the Congress of Cults was convened, you know, um, in, in uh, I think it was 1940, I can't remember the year now, 1944, 44, maybe. I thought, yeah. Yeah, I think it was 44. So the Soviets had come in, and this is what they do. First, they pretend to tolerate the church, and then the hammer comes down. That's how it always works. And so the Soviets have taken over the government, and now um, if you are a pastor, you have to be registered. And if you give them any grief, you're going to be arrested. And if you don't spy on your congregation, they're going to kill your family, all this kind of crazy thing. 
And so they decide to bring all the, um, you know, in it, even the name of it, Congress of Cults, very demeaning, very insulting. And it was a huge conference, and they brought together all these people. The honorary chairman of this was, of course, Joseph Stalin, right. who also was the head of the World Atheist Organization, quite ironic. Right. And, uh, you know, what happens when the church doesn't stand firm, in my opinion, is, you know, we begin to bend to the world. We begin to, you know, think what is in our best interest. And one after another, leaders from the different denominations and Orthodox churches stood up and gave various speeches saying, you know, we really think communism, the church can be wonderful together. And we really think that, you know, Nietzsche and, and all these communist writers, you know, Marx and uh, Hegel, uh, they have a lot to teach us and on and on and on. And it's just this terrible, um, complete repudiation of the authority of the scriptures and the word of God. And of course, of the entire group. And when we, when we filmed this, it was quite a process to film this. Um, we rented a place called the Odeon theater, which is this beautiful hundred year old theater in Romania, which is just really charming. And, and it's got like these white Marchand walls and it had a roof. It was built in 1903 and the roof retracted. Can you believe they had retractable roofs in 1903? Really? And, Are you uh, serious? Yeah. I saw, you know, we wow. watched a moment, a giant mechanical thing. And th this place where we filmed the scene probably holds a total of maybe 400, 450 people. We didn't have that many extras. We had about 35 or 40. Right. So we had to multiple, we had to have cameras stationed all over the room and we had to move those 30 people from each angle all through the thing and have them do each reaction. It was a long, painstaking day to try to make the illusion of a packed house and cheering people and everything that you see in the movie. But in reality, the actual Congress of Cults was, was 10 times bigger than that. They were like wow. 4,000. Wow. We just we didn't have a place that would let us film there. But so imagine the, the chutzpah, <laughs> the courage to stand up the way Richard did. And, they, and that scene, they've both written about that in their memoirs. I think we have it fairly accurately when he, she says they're spitting in the face of Christ. Mm. Won't you wash away this shame? And Richard knows what she's asking. And his response to her is so tender. She says, he says, you know that if I speak, mm. you will have no husband, mm. which, which really says something to me. He doesn't say, you know, if I speak, I'm going to get my brains beat in. If I speak, I'm going to go to jail. His thought is the way he words that is for her, exactly. very Christ-like. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church and gave himself for her. You know if I speak, you will have no husband. And she says, do I need a coward for a husband? And she doesn't say that by being mad at him. She is one with him and on task and on mission. And he does. He speaks before the Congress, and he stops it. His speech ended the entire thing. He gets up there, and people, all these church leaders who were being forced to say things they didn't want to say. When one guy had the courage to say, who do we worship? Who do we stand here for? The party or the, or the Lord? They start cheering, pastor rule, pastor rule. And he barely gets out of there. It's, <laughs> and you're right, shortly thereafter, he's a marked man. Right. He's a marked man. But he also, even though he would pay the price, we did a few scenes of who was listening that day. And you saw in the movie, there's a family divided. The father doesn't like this, what this guy's saying, but the mother does resonate with there's somebody speaking for the gospel there was an old couple who are frustrated with what's happened to their country and they're so encouraged that they join the underground church and that's what was born out of this day that the orthodox registered churches were no longer safe and so really for the first time an underground church began to grow in romania in the 40s and they would meet at houses and they had to be very careful because they would be everyone was spying on their neighbors, you know, and and anyone who turned in their neighbor for breaking a party rule would, you know, would get a a benefit of some sort. And so you're not just sort of trying to hide out from government people, you your your neighbors or your kids or everyone's spying on everybody. It, it was horrible. And of course, eventually Richard was imprisoned and the later Sabina was also arrested, which left their ten year old boy just alone at home, orphaned, you know, and uh yeah. it, it was a horrible, horrible time. It's an excellent movie, John. You did a fantastic job on it. And you kept bringing in these waves of emotion of all this stuff coming in. I was like, man, okay, I'm done tearing up right now. Then five minutes later, I'm like, John, quit doing this to me, man. <laughs> did it again. And I'm going to put a link to where you can rent and watch that movie. I would say if you're looking for a movie to check out, I would say definitely 
check that movie out because it really, I think it's going to encourage you and ignite your faith in Christ even more because you're going to see how all these Romanian Christians, how they didn't back down. They didn't, they didn't turn one another in. They were standing true to the faith. They were standing firm in the midst of this persecution and all this torturing. And so I want to say this one thing here, that one of the last things that you had in the movie was a quote from another saint that Richard had quoted. He says, there's two types of Christians, those who sincerely love God and those who just sincerely say they love God. Man, I I want to be the former one, John. That's what I want to be. You know, he's quoting uh, Savonarola, who okay. was a martyr in Florence, uh, Savonarola the martyr. And he is, Richard, when he says that, he's just been locked into a solitary isolation cell. Mm. And they would do things like complete sensory deprivation. The guards wore socks. You, you were just a, alone, 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 all day, all night, not knowing day or night. Richard built himself a routine where during the day— uh, this I didn't put in the film. He would compose an entire sermon. He would write it, think it through, lay it out in his mind. He had no writing utensils, nothing to write with. He had to do this in his mind. At uh, at 10 o'clock, when it was time for they would be the lights out, then he would uh, pray for an hour. And then at 11 o'clock, he would preach his sermon to the angels in his cell. Wow. And it was complete. Brothers and sisters, today we're going to open the Bible to James chapter 2, where it says, guard, you know, whatever. And off he'd go. And his mind was so sharp. And uh, later on in life, he, was re- he actually released a book called, like, I forget the title of it, like, Sermons in the Walls or something. He remembered about 40 of those sermons. But one scene really strikes me. It's not just that they held firm, but but what really gets me, and I think probably many of us, is how they did it. And, and really, my job as a filmmaker and a writer was to stay out of the way. Richard's words are better than mine could ever be. But one day, he would be beaten. The, the guard would come by, and he would peek in his, his isolation cell. Once again, there's Richard on his knees, praying. And the guard, you remember, this, kicks open the door and starts beating Richard and kicks him in the he rips him down the aisle, beats him in the face, throws him back in the cell. The next night he comes by, there's Richard praying. Oh, every night he's just abusing this guy. Finally, <laughs> one night the guard opens the little peephole. Richard's praying again. This time the guard loses his cool. Wormbrand, you know, what do you think you're doing? Right. Your wife is in prison. Your son is an orphan. You'll never get out of here. Your life belongs to me. What could you possibly have to pray for anymore, you reprobate? Yeah. And Richard says, <laughs> I was praying for you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that got me right there. And that and that Ooh. guy in that scene, he just he just stopped and choked up. <laughs> yeah. The guy that act, that played that out did really well on that mm. pause. You must have coached oh. him up really good on that one, John. That was really good. Well, uh, you know, you, you get a chance to uh, – I'll say one thing about the actors. This this entire cast, we decided to film this film in Romania to use the actual prisons where Richard was, was truly held to be as authentic as we could to the locations. And, uh, you know, they say directing is 90% casting. <laughs> and oh, okay. I thank God that he led us to Emil Mandanak, who played Richard Wormbrand, and Raluca Botez, who played, who played Sabrina, uh, Sabina. But then also all those other actors, who some of them had smaller parts, like that particular guard, because the talent level and the, the commitment that they made, because it was freezing cold in these prisons. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I didn't want us to have any space heaters. I wanted there to be true breath because right. these were winter scenes, and so these actors were in very difficult conditions. And uh, every last one of them, just I believe, the reason the movie is so watchable and and why you stay with it is the performances are so so great. I like the fact that you were actually dubbing in here a bit. You had scenes where you dubbed in the audio because Richard, even though he's Romanian, he spoke fluent Russian. And I don't know if you know this, John, but I actually took two semesters of Russian in college because I was going to yeah. do I was going to do like international business or work for the FBI or try to at the time. And so yeah. I, a lot of those words you were saying, I was like, I know those, Bajalista, Spaziba. 
Yeah, I mean, da. Espasiba, I mean, uh, gum, yeah. yeah, espasiba. Or, or sp- <sighs> spasiba, they also used for saying thank you, but pajalsta, yeah, 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 you're spasiba. welcome and things. So it was. Pajalsta. Yeah, so it well, was really cool. Well, the actors, cool. we made the decision. This was another one of these creative decisions. Like when you see a Bible film, right, and you go watch many. Now, The Passion of the Christ didn't do this, but many Bible films, they speak English. Now, we know at the time they spoke Aramaic, you know, or Hebrew. Uh, or Greek, but they didn't speak English. So there's a certain jump in order to get to our ears. So now we're going to do this film, and are, am I going to do um, over, you know, subtitles? Are we going to do subtitles, or are we going to have these guys speak English, or how are we going to handle this? And we thought a lot about that. So what we did was we had the actors uh, speak the languages that they would have spoken. Richard and Sabina, Richard spoke 14 languages fluently. And so at home, it was wow. realistic that he might have spoken English. So I do have the actor speaking English in some scenes. Of course, he speaks Romanian in some scenes, and those scenes have subtitles. But also, Richard spoke Russian. So Emil, who didn't speak a word of Russian, had to learn Russian for all of his parts, as did several of the other actors. And we had to have Russian dialect coaches for them. Right. So that actor took a lot of time to be able to speak a language and Russian is not similar to no. Romanian. We think, well, if it's not English, they're probably similar. No, they're just as divergent as Russian is from English. So it was interesting to have three languages in the movie. And what I'm hopeful of is that you don't ever really notice any of them. Like you don't know when you're reading a subtitle and then all of a sudden they're speaking English because it's a private scene. So that it's if there's a there's an, a whiff of authenticity about it, but it's not a struggle for the viewer. No, I didn't think it was. that's what we tried to get. Yeah, I didn't think it was. I'm just saying I picked up on it because yeah, you I were, know a lot of these words. Russian. Yeah, and, and yeah. even out now in public, for, in fact, the first time, one of the first times I took my wife out when we were dating, I said, hey, I speak Russian every now and then, you know, just something I learned in college. She said, no, you didn't. No, you don't. So the waitress was Russian, and I started speaking in Russian. She's like, oh, I think you're telling the truth here. <laughs> so, but, well, you would have it up on me when, when, when they are uh, – now, as a director, so my actors are out there speaking Russian, speaking Romanian. I don't speak either of those. So I'm directing scenes where I cannot understand what they're saying. I know what they're supposed to say. I know what the script says. Right. But I had to have a guy right next to me on all those scenes because sometimes an actor would ad lib and I've got my big iPad and I'm writing furiously on it. Like, what did he say? What is it? So there's some ad lib that I always want to give freedom for an actor. But when they're doing ad lib in Romanian, I don't know what they're saying. Right. That, so that's that, was, that was an interesting challenge. But on Russian, if you knew if they said, if you told them her, her show, John her show, that meant very good. Or net, you were saying net. That's no, no, no. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. we're digressing here. I, I want to get back to this topic here. So I will say this about the movie because I want to get into like two more questions here before we hit the supercharge round. Hey, Men Plug, we're going to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere as John and I are going to give you some extra firepower right after we hear this quick message. All right, Men Plug Faithful, are you ready to put your life into maximum overdrive? I've got a special offer for you. Go to menunplug.net forward slash book, that's B-O-O-K, to get your free audiobook and 30-day free trial of one of our sponsors, Audible. That's menunplug.net forward slash book to get your free audiobook today that you can listen to in your car, at the gym, or if you're like me, while you're mowing the yard. And if you haven't done so already, go to menunplug.net to sign up for our weekly email. You'll get first-hand information about all of our shows, resources, and the chance to offer your own valued feedback about the show. That's right. I want to hear from you. And to be one of the first ones to get a discounted copy of my upcoming book, go to menunplug.net to sign up to our email list. You mentioned Room 4 earlier in that prison that he went to up in in the mountain region. And most of those prisoners that went there didn't make it out. And what I thought was really cool was this is a good encouraging point here for anyone, whatever in the marketplace, at home, at church, wherever you are. If you stand up for what's right, you stand up for um, what's true in God's word, you are going to get some persecution. You might not get it like that, but you'll get something like ridicule. You might get judgment. You might be getting looked down upon. You're going to get something. And Mm -hmm. what I really thought was encouraging here was that Richard said that even the most devout atheist prisoners that came to that cell, room four, and even a lot of Russian guards, they left saved men. That was oh, so I know. cool. It's, it's amazing. He, he says, uh, 
many men came into room four an atheist, but not one died an atheist. Yeah. And no one survived but him. So he was there ushering, you know, all, excuse me, all these guys. And we'll never know. But I thought that was amazing, too. Not one died an atheist. Not one died without making peace with God. Hmm. All right. So I got to ask you this here. I'm going to got two more questions here. We're going to hit the supercharge round. But I got to ask this, though. How did you stay composed long enough? to shoot this film because you were there in Romania. And, and I think you told me in some of those same spots, maybe even at one point, the prison cell and you actually built a carcer, which yeah, is, a, yeah. which a man is a contraption with some serious torture elements to it. So I'm gonna let you go ahead and answer that question. Well, one, we had a lot of prayer. I mean, we had a lot of prayer and, and, uh, and, and like I had my little church, you know, in South Haven, Michigan, I put the actors pictures up in front of the screen on Sunday. and said, we pray for these two actors mm. that are playing Richard and Sabina. And I felt those prayers. We felt it in the weather. You know, we had the very first day of shooting. We had the scene where, where Sabina is, is in a women's labor camp and she's marching home at the end of a wintry, cold, blustery day. And the guards trip her and pick on her and, <clears throat> and they throw her into the icy waters of the Danube river. That's the first day we're going to shoot. Well, when we scouted this uh, first time in October, there was the river. We found a spot. When we scouted it again in December, there was a river. There was a spot. When we went to shoot in early February, it was totally frozen over, and there were four feet of snow on the whole thing a week before we were supposed to shoot. Well, you can't throw Sabina into a river that's covered with snow and frozen. Right. And that was day one. Well, all I can tell you is by some amazing hand of God— the day before we were supposed to shoot, the temperatures hit 40, and they were 40 the day we shot, and 40 the next day. The river melted. We threw her in, and then after we were done, it froze up again. And we wow. had that kind of little things happening all through the project, which just kind of kept me smiling and grinning. And I, um, you know, I, But it was a heavy air thing. We did build a carcer. We were in these prisons. It was bitterly cold, but there was such a good spirit between the cast and crew that um you know we really really felt supported and my wife was with me <clears throat> you know my wife was there and she would be doing her thing all day in in the in the production uh trailer and preparing the the dailies for the next day and all that and i would be out there working with these great people and uh, it was a total joy it mm. really was and that's why i want to do a sequel or now or a prequel i want to go back and tell the story of how did these two people become christians in the first place because when we meet them in Tortured for Christ, right off the bat, they're already pretty incredible people. But but it's very interesting to back up and find who were they when they met each other, because they were both atheists. Right. Richard was a communist. Right. And so if we ever get, by God's grace, a chance to make this next movie called Richard and Sabina, uh, Tortured for Christ, the Nazi Years, you'll, you'll meet them and you'll see the arc of their lives from complete atheist hedonists to being the people that are going to live out this life and in, in, uh, that you're meeting in the second movie. So it's quite a it's quite a broad journey that God has taken them on, which I also think is a little encouraging because we are not God's not finished with us any of us yet either. Right. So you might go, well, I could never be that. Well, look at where they started. They didn't start, you know, none of us started really any further from the Lord than they did. So <clears throat> that's a good story. No, that's a good word right there. And that leads me to this question here. Expand on what you just said there, that God's not done with us. So like we said earlier, as believers, most of us, especially those of us in North America, we're, for the most part, probably not going to experience this type of persecution. I mean, let's just be honest. But we still need to stand tall in the midst of trying to be politically correct, God doesn't call us to be politically correct. He calls us to stand true to his word. So for the listener right now, what can you say, words of encouragement or wisdom that they can do to stand true to the Christian faith? Well, you know, it's, it's, for me, anyway, I don't know about for everybody else, but it's almost for me. It's almost easier to be belligerent in some ways because I'm pretty sure about than it is to be loving. The call to be mm. loving is harder. Yeah, and and you know, yes, I I think it's important to to hold true to the word, and yes, I think that you know it, it, evil thrives when good men do nothing, and and there are times, but to be loving is what really blows me away about Richard and Sabina. They they had every reason to hate. 
Mm. Every reason. Sabina's entire family, this would be in the, in the new film, were, were killed in, in the Romanian Holocaust. And, and Richard ends up meeting the very man who killed them, who executed her three sisters, her mother and her father, her mm. brothers, and brings this man into their house. Now, <laughs> the, to find a way to be to have the Holy Spirit living in us in such a way that we are representatives of God. Yes, we hold to the truth, and then we also have to pray that the Lord gives us a, a love for these people. And that's, we do have that challenge in North America, because right. trust me, there's plenty of hatred in our country right now, and, and sometimes we're at the forefront of it. That's a challenge for me. I'm not preaching to anybody but myself. But Richard is an example for me of someone who says, all right, these are my enemies. What does the Bible say? Oh, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Well, he sure did get persecuted, and he learned how to pray for them. Um, that's a step that's easier said than done. Yeah, and I would just want to close here with some Scripture verses here that um, I think would really help um, just kind of expand on and support what John has been sharing here and really what Richard and Sabina went through in that movie and forefathers like Stephen and all the early believers that were martyred. We have these examples that we yes. can learn from. And so 1 Peter 5, 9 says, resist the devil, stand firm in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. We got other brothers and sisters in Christ that are being persecuted so we can experience the same thing, even tougher if need be. And then Philippians 1.27, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. And this is one for me, John, that is one of my life verses. I don't know about you, but it's Matthew 10, 32 through 33. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father. Mm. I want Jesus to be telling God the Father about me, because I'm telling others about him. That's what mm. I want. John, you ready to rock the supercharge round? Uh, yeah, let's do it. All right, man. Let's just fire away here. I want to know here, what were the circumstances that led to your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? You know, yeah, my faith was uh, was born in my my parents, wonderful, godly parents. My father's a pastor and a great guy, and uh, I loved him. And he was great athlete and fun and easy. And and he uh, the best thing he could have done was was just sort of tag let me tag along with him. And he would be leading youth retreats in the mountains of Arizona, and and I got to go to the camps with him, and I got to hear speakers and speakers and speakers. And it started to dawn on me that this was true. This is the truth. And I want a piece of this. <laughs> and so uh, 12 years old, just lying in a bunk bed at a camp in the desert called Watuka Oaks. I mean, no fanfare, no big altar call, just, Lord, I want to make sure that uh, I have sincerely confessed and repented for the sin in my life and, and leaned into you and leaned on you. And so, you know, it's not, a, I didn't have a super dramatic testimony, but I thank God for, for godly parents, and I thank God for godly influences at, at various just places that I was exposed to. And, and because of that, I just think it's so important we support our kids when they get a chance to go to Christian camps or get on Christian retreats. Um, man, parents, we need those voices talking to our kids, and we need to pray for those counselors and those speakers that they just speak the truth because if they do, the truth will work. I, I believe still in those kids' hearts, and and many of them, you know, it'll take root in good soil. So that's my that's my story. Hey, praise the Lord! I really like that. Okay, I want to ask you this one here. You talked earlier about you have this God given um, ability, this innate ability to create ideas, and, and in a lot of ways, I'm like that. I, I'm this idea for your guy, a guy that's a visionary that's always creating ideas, right? So I want to ask you, because I've struggled with this at times myself, how do you get to the point when you're creating these ideas? How do you say to yourself, okay, this is the idea I'm going to stick with. I know this is going to work. You see what I mean? And then take it on the other side with, man, I thought this was a good idea and it, it was just a complete bust. 
Boy, that is a powerful question. I would certainly admit to not having that mastered, but I, I will give you an example that I that I think is helpful, and I, I'm trying to do this now because I'm <laughs> I'm still I'm still guilty of not answering that question properly. I've got so many different irons in the fire and things that I'm passionate about. But I think about King David, you know, and the, if you think back to the in the Bible and in in, uh, in Samuel and, and David. Uh, is this sort of passionate, eccentric, sometimes he's, you know, godly, and sometimes he's just sinful as all get out. Mm. And he screwed up in ways really worse than you, I swear, worse than you and I could ever screw up. His screw-ups cost men their lives by the village loads, you know? David, my goodness, what he would do. So there's the story where, uh, for example, uh, David literally goes and joins the Philistines team to fight against Saul, Jonathan, and the Israelites. That's how Bad of a decision David makes. He's going to join idea. the enemies. Not He's joining idea. ISIS. Imagine David uh. joining ISIS. <clears throat> and it really was the the Philistine warriors in, who said, you know what, we don't really want this guy fighting with us because what if what if he's really just trying to get in the good graces of Saul and he turns on us? So Aklash sends David away and says, go back to Ziklag, you can't fight with us. When David and his 600 men get back to Ziklag, what happened was he wasn't there to protect it, and the Amalekites have come and taken all the women and children and burned the city to the ground, and his men are furious at him. You dragged us over to fight with the Philistines, which was stupid. We didn't do anything, which is a waste of our time. We come back, our wives and our children are gone, and our cities have been burned. Mm. David, like he always does when the chips are down, he seeks the Lord, and he says, Lord, what should I do? What should I, and and my translation that I read recently was, what should I pursue? Mm. And in that case, the Lord says, pursue the Amalekites. You'll get back your women and your children. And so he takes the men, stop your girlman, we have a job to do. They pursue the Amalekites, they take back their women and their children. So I guess my answer is, again, I, this is an answer to me, Jeff, not to anybody else, but we got to pray, Lord, what do you want me to pursue? This, there's one life, you know, we have one shot on this stage. And uh, who are we supposed to care for? Who is our responsibility for? We're supposed to pursue our wives, I know that. That's going to come up first and foremost every time you seek the Lord. Love your wife. If you can't do that, then let's focus on that till we can move on. Right. If you're married. Um, anyway, that's David's prayer, and I'm I'm seriously trying to incorporate that one myself. That's a good word right there. The question is when you're praying is, Lord, what do you want me to pursue? Because a yes. lot of times what I ask is, what do you want me to do? Boy, that's a really open-ended question that, that yes. a lot of times I don't get the answer to. Have you ever had those moments, you're like, man, this was it, and it was a bust. What do you do then? Huh. You know, that. uh, it'd be interesting to just probably dive deep into what do you mean by a bust, because sometimes things we think were busts. I mean, was was it a bust when Richard got arrested on the streets of Bucharest? That's a good you question. Know, that that ended his ministry. He didn't see his wife and his child for 14 years. Uh, did, did he do the wrong thing? In the middle of that bust, he became pastor to hundreds, maybe thousands of men in the prisons. And he's inspiring us today. And, you know, he's alone for three years in isolation mm. and he's losing his mind, thinking he'll never get out. The last thing he ever thought he would be, the last thing was famous. <laughs> you know, right. you're alone in a cell for three years. You're going to die lonely, alone, anonymous, forgotten. His wife thought he was dead. No one knows where he was. They changed his name when he was put in the prison. So that seems like a bust in the in the eyes of the world, but it was not a bust in the eyes of God. And so I guess if we could sort of keep asking the Lord, you know, I'm here to do your will, not mine. You know, Gethsemane was kind of a bust. You know, Jesus is arrested. Right. <laughs> could have, they could have ran. He could have not gone to Jerusalem for Passover this year. Man, the disciples told him not to. Well, obviously, what was a defeat in the eyes of the world, what was a victory in the eyes of Satan, was actually a victory in the eyes of God, who has a much longer view. So one thing is keep the longer view. Um, but then on a just strictly pragmatic level, sometimes we do have to pivot. You know, this is why, you know, you date before you get married. You know, I've written things that have never gone anywhere. And we used to write songs and do concerts. And we had a rule that we, if I wrote a song or my partner Dwight wrote a song, we wouldn't ever kill a song until we'd played it three times. If we do it in three different times and it goes nowhere, then that's enough. 
put it in the back drawer and leave it alone. And if after three times it takes root, then you might have a song. So nothing wrong with testing our trees and seeing if they bear fruit. And if the tree uh, isn't bearing fruit, then the Bible says prune it. You know, take the rocks out of the soil and give it another chance. And then if it still doesn't bear any fruit, cut it down and burn it. There you go. (laughs) Sometimes we got to do that. I like that. Pivot. I like that. That's a good word. Pivot. If it's not going right, just pivot. And sometimes it's just pivoting for a while. Then you come back to it. You know, you get more resources, something like that. You got, you got something, you tweak it just a tad bit. And then you know what? You got a winner on your hands. So I want to, I want to ask you this. Is there a giant in your life that you've had to tackle that was really like, man, I, at one point you're like, I never thought I was going to get rid of that. But finally, through the Lord's strength, you were able to overcome it. Well, it's a very good question. Um, of course, I mean, I, we're trying to overcome our. Uh, I, I don't. I haven't had any addictions, so like, I'm not a good story, and like, I've never had an addiction that I'm. Um, have had to overcome, and thank God for that. I, I, Praise the I, I Lord. don't want to have that. I don't want to have that testimony, um, and I've been spared in that. But man, to overcome ourselves mm. and to overcome our egos. And to become humble in the eyes of the Lord, when you're sort of a natural performer, performers and movie makers and songers, they need to be sort of self-promotional. You know, there's part of me that Jeff comes on your on your your podcast today and says, "Boy, I hope somebody hears this and hire me to direct the next movie." Right? Selfishness, you know, self-promotion. The Bible doesn't give us any quarter for that, man. We are not right. to be those people. We're 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 kingdom workers who point. If we're doing this right, we point toward the Lord. We don't right. point towards ourself. And uh, again, counterintuitive to the world, counterintuitive to a uh, look-at-me culture, a, a Facebook culture. A, 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 I've got to promote my brand. I've got to make my name. I need to be the biggest, the best, the loudest, the best-selling, the most famous. I, I don't even think that we recognize the danger. I don't recognize the danger in that. That's probably worse than any addiction that I would have to overcome to a to a drug or to a bottle or to a, a pornography. But if I can't get over myself, then I haven't really been transformed by the gospel. So let's make sure, man, what we really are passionate about is expanding the fame and the glory of God. We expand the fame and the glory of God. And man, we get to kind of ride his coattails is what we get. You know, we get the joy and the and the forgiveness and the peace that passes understanding. Uh, we try to ride our own coattails and point at us, man, we're going to get abused. We're going to get taken advantage of. Something's not going to go right. We're going to get sued when we shouldn't have got. All that's going to happen to us. The world's going to happen to us. But if we're, if we're working to the glory of God, I, I remember I used to say before we'd go take the stage for a gig, Lord, we're doing this for your glory. If we blow it tonight, it's your loss. So be with us. <laughs> take a lot of pressure off. Yeah, there you you go. Hey, that's the way to do it. That is a good word right there. I can appreciate that. And you talked about, you know, I think part of the reason why we do this so much is all the social media. I've mentioned this before, but it's to try to get to the noise. You mentioned it earlier, cutting through the noise. That's what we have yeah. to do. And I had to, I had to learn that myself, trying to really get this show off the ground uh, almost a year ago, trying to sift through this noise, all this social media from everything else. And You know, what I realized is if we're stuck in that trap, John, if we're stuck in that trap of trying to sift through all the noise, we're not hearing the most important sound at all. We're not hearing God's voice. We got to be still in our souls first to hear Him. That's the most important sound we need to hear. We need to turn down the volume on everything else. So I usually ask every guest, or I should say most of my guests, What is their favorite book and what do they get from it? But for you as a writer, a movie director and producer, I want to ask you, what's your favorite movie other than your own? Maybe top (laughs) one or two, top one or two that you're like, man, this really spoke to me. Mm. Well, I should have an answer for that. The answer, I'll tell you what I've said for the last 20 years. I've said Schindler's List. That was a good movie. For 20 years when someone said, what's the, what do you think the best movie? I always said, well, I'm going to say Schindler's List. I think it was the best thing Spielberg ever did. I think the acting was fantastic, and I think the story was powerful. So I'm happy to go Schindler's List. Uh, you know, it's a classic movie, and it's strong, and it's powerful. It's not a, not a Christian movie, but it's a, a Jewish man at the center of it learns to do good despite himself. Um, so I really like that one. I mean, this past year 
you know, none of the films that I liked over the course of this year are going to make it to the Academy Awards. So uh, this year, this maybe isn't, again, a terribly um, – I don't know why it came to my mind, but I love this movie called Beirut. Um, hmm. it, Never heard of it. It was just one. a great movie uh, written uh, by Terry Gilliam, who I think is the best screenwriter. Uh, John Hamm starred in it. It's just a you can rent it. It's again, I'm not telling you this because this is a great Christian movie, but to me, I just got to recognize excellence when I see it. You know, in Philippians, whatever is good and whatever is pure, whatever is true and whatever is worthy, these things are worth thinking about. Hmm. So I do think sometimes, man, if I'm listening to Pachelbel's Canon and D, or if I'm listening to the Doobie Brothers, or if I'm listening to Christian music, sometimes excellence is its own praise for me. So I like the movie Beirut. I thought it was beautifully executed. I like Schindler's List. Um, I like of Christian movies. I'll give you my last one. I think maybe my favorite of the Christian mu- movies would probably be Amazing Grace, uh, oh, the William yeah. Wilberforce story. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed that. It's been a long time since I've seen it. That's though, a good so. movie. That is a good movie. Hey, you. You actually talked about some stuff. You brought some stuff from the past, man. Doobie Brothers, Jesus is just still uh, right That's with right. me. Hey, <laughs> I by, go way back. by the way, I cannot sing, man. It's terrible. So <laughs> sorry, Men Unplugged, I bet you got that. I'm just a terrible singer. On that note here about movies, I want to ask you here about your upcoming stuff here. Kind of take about three to four minutes here and dive into some of these uh, feature films that you have coming up. Yeah, well, I hope they're coming up. I've been writing a lot lately, Jeff. So I mentioned earlier I've got a prequel uh, called Richard and Sabina that I would love to be in production in and back in Romania and tell the rest of their story. We're looking for funding for that. I just wrote a comedy, just a straight on let's make people laugh and have fun called Holiday Dracula, which I think <clears throat> is a hoot about a down and out American couple who uh, try scheme after scheme and then wake up one morning and she, her aunt Awana has died and she has inherited a, a castle in Transylvania and that's a wonderful comedy. I'm working on a fantastic story right now um, where I, I've been interested in a, a new studio that we're starting called America Studios. <clears throat> and in America Studios, everything we make will be stories from American history about heroism and courage. And uh, the element of faith is so often at the center of the story of the, the emergence of America and its leadership. So I want to tell stories about American history <clears throat> that don't that don't exclude the the rock foundational value that, that faith in God and the Judeo-Christian heritage and the Ten Commandments had on the founding of our country. And I'm working on a film called Nine Days a Soldier about a group of uh, 14-year-old boys who fought in the War of 1812 and turned the pivotal battle of that war. Uh, it's a great little story, and I'm, I'm just writing that today. Um, and I'm basing it on a, on a little novel that I found at a, at a on a card table at a festival by a woman named Joy DeMar. So it's an adapted screenplay from her novel. Uh, I've got another film that I'd like to put uh, out that's already written. It's called Forbidden Speech. And right. I could talk to you about that one for an hour, but about the First Amendment and it's um, how it's being um, massacred today and misinterpreted today in our country. And it's being used to prevent freedom of religion and freedom of speech rather than to protect it. And I'd like to shoot Forbidden Speech this year. So for, for us, we have no shortage of uh, screenplays and ideas. How can they find out about these? Grotersproductions.com, right? Give them that URL if you can. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, Grotersproductions.com is our company website. My personal one is just johngroters.com, and that's G-R-O-O-T-E-R-S. Well, I'm going to put links to those uh, websites on this show post, so make sure, Men Unplugged, that you check out the post for this episode. And I want to ask you this here. Give me one parting tip of wisdom before we say goodbye. You know, God is not done with us, so... (laughs) There, we walk on this balance between the honesty of being confessional and being repentant and realizing that there's almost nothing good in us, which is true. I mean, we're reprobates at heart, we, we can, but God is not done with us. And I'm uh, optimistic despite all the things that can be negative. And I hope we can, you know, you were back in Philippians earlier, and uh, it's just a great verse that Paul sent to that little church in Philippi, I am sure that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Right. Uh, if that's not hopeful, um, man, so keep keep at that marriage, keep at that project, keep at that living faithfully, keep at overcoming that addiction or that uh, sin, because God is the one working it through in you. It doesn't have to just be on your own strength. Let the Lord do it. Let the Holy Spirit do it. He's not quitting on you. 
He's not quitting on me or Jeff, and he's going to carry it to its completion until we're completed in the day of Jesus Christ and his return. Um, that's super, super hopeful, and just believe on that. Excellent. That is the exact way we should wrap up this show. John, thank you for being on the show today, man. You rock the mic, man. Great job. <laughs> Great to do this. I had a lot of fun, and I want to get you on my podcast, and uh, I want to turn the tables and interview you for 45 minutes, Jeff, oh, so let's man. do that soon. Hey, that sounds like fun, man. I'm really looking forward to that. All right, that wraps up today's show. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you're encouraged or equipped by today's show, please share this or any other episode to someone else you know right now. And to find out about the resources that we have at Men Unplugged, including my speaking and training forms for your men's group, your church, or even event, go to menunplugged.net to sign up for our weekly email list and to catch the show notes for today's episode. When you sign up to our weekly email list, I'm going to send you a free PDF copy of one of my books and you're also going to have a chance to get a discounted copy of my upcoming book that's set to be released between now and March of 2019. Until next time, stay plugged in and recharged. God bless. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. There's plenty more to see at menunplugged.net, including key resources and ways to engage with Jeff in his training and speaking forums. While there, don't forget to subscribe and receive a free gift. We look forward to you joining us next time here on the Men Unplugged Show. Oh, 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 oh,